just never knew how to tell you. I would tell be able to what? talk about my Can life. You what I, I ever loved a lot. I have a two arms. You want me to say it out loud? I said, I have nothing to live for, nothing. And I walked over and um, turned the water on in the tub, took a razor blade, cut both of my, my wrists, and just laid back in the tub and waited. I'm laying in that tub and I'm thinking, nobody cares about me. I'm just, in, you know, why, why live? Nobody cares. I remember that God spoke to me then in that still small voice in the mind's ear and said to me, Troy, I love you, and I want to tell you something. You're my son. I don't have stepsons and daughters. I tell people today, I'm eternally grateful uh, because I didn't die that night. If you love the Lord this morning, would you say amen? amen. Turn to the person just where you're at and say, God bless you. You're in the right place this morning. Amen. Well, thinking back from the time we were kids, not in my wildest dreams would I ever thought that Troy Perry would be where he's at today. I want to uh, share with you for a few minutes this morning about going first class. Amen. See, I believe with all of my heart that God calls us all. We who are in our community, God calls us to go first class. Amen. It's just hard to believe that it's came this far. It really is. It's overwhelming. It really is. My mom and dad um, loved me unconditionally. Uh, as a little boy, I was the oldest of five boys. You know, we could get out and run Tallahassee. We, we went anywhere we wanted to. There was no, you know, in the day back then, it wasn't that heavily populated. But everybody knew the Perry boys around there. So if we got into trouble, uh, we were told on real quick, like. Troy, from as far back as I can remember, was doing some type preaching. Maybe it was a morbid way of doing things, but he did funerals. We had our cousin, she would sing and Troy would preach, but I would find him a dead bug. If I couldn't find him a dead one, I'd kill one and bring to him so he could preach his funerals. But I didn't mind, because when he would go to preach, and I'll tell anybody, I can listen to my brother preach all day. He, he just a joy to listen to. My father was killed in an automobile wreck. I was uh, 12 years old. And I remember waking up and hearing <clears throat> my mother screaming. <clears throat> and she was saying, our daddy's dead. Uh, just like that, our daddy's dead. It was right after that that my mother said to me, and it stuck with me for the rest of my life. She said, you have to help me raise your brothers. You're, you're gonna have to be the, the daddy to them, the father. So I took her very seriously. Uh, you know, I may be 12 going on 13, but I've gotta help my mother. I knew in my head somehow I had to do that. After my dad died, uh, we used to always go up to uh, South Georgia. My Uncle Wes uh, and my Uncle Arthur on uh, farms, and it was while I was there. My Aunt Lizzie Smithy, um, I have an amazing family. She was one of the founders of the snake handling churches in America. Now, it was really, really cute because Aunt Lizzie Smithy, she handled snakes, she handled fire, she handled light bulbs, you name it, anything hot. Uh, you know, she drank strychnine, those churches did. And she would always quote to me from the book of Mark and say, 
Troy Jr., I believe with all my heart, she said uh, that you're called to ministry, but she prophesied over me and said, but I want to tell you now, it won't be in the church of God, the church you're in. I thought she was nutty because I dearly love the church that I was in. I had no idea that the day would come when I would found a denomination. You know, he was different. I tell people, none of the rest of the brothers, I've never heard them say it, but to me, the, I knew there was something there. I didn't think gay, I didn't know what it was. I have always known that I was a homosexual. I don't know how to explain it, but as most gay men will tell you, there's something somewhere where we know we're different. I had a um, wonderful, wonderful young man who lived in my neighborhood, he was probably 12. I was nine. He had the largest collection of comic books I'd ever seen in my life. And his name was uh, Delmer Popple. And I remember going to Delmer's house one day. And um, Delmer and I was there in his bedroom looking at comic books. And um, he touched me. And uh, I touched him back. He was the first person I'd had physical contact with uh, that way. So he and I used to go off to the woods and we would go out and we would play. Now, I didn't call it a relationship then because when you're little, you don't know what relations, you don't understand any of that, but it was incredible. And uh, to this day, I have fond memories to this day. Pentecostal churches didn't preach about sex, only in the most general sense. But they would have never used the word homosexual from their pulpit back then. And you've got to remember, too, that I come from a generation where people uh, viewed homosexuality not as a separate act, uh, but as a heterosexual doing something bad. You know, a queer was different. That was a person, that was a sissy. And I knew I wasn't a sissy. Whatever else I may have been, I wasn't a sissy, and that's the way I viewed it. And so that was the way you justified it in your head. And yes, I've sinned, but because we Pentecostals believe God can forgive any sin, all I had to do was pray and God forgive it until the next time I did it, and then I'd pray again and God would forgive me and I'd do it again. So that's how I handled it. I just would uh, go, even as a kid, to the Pentecostal church and to the altar and would pray, oh, God forgive me, and God did. Troy was having a hard time coming to grips that he was a homosexual. When here was something that also he had been taught biblically, religiously, whatever, uh, that, uh, that it was wrong. Uh, I'm 18 years old. Now the Church of God said, before you can be ordained, you have to marry. And when I married, I really didn't know what love was all about. And now, of course, I'm beginning to meet men, never knew their names, hardly. Uh, and it was not a lot. I don't mean it like it was just all kinds of men. It wasn't. But it was just quick, anonymous sex, just to have sex, but not often. My wife and our two kids moved to Santa Ana, California, where I was appointed the pastor of the Church of God of Prophecy. I went into a bookstore in Santa Ana, California. I wanted to preach a sermon out of an article that someone had told me was in this magazine that month. I went into this bookstore, and when I went in, uh, I picked up the magazine, but I started looking around, and something happened. For the first time in my life, I saw physique magazines. I had never seen a physique magazine in my life. I cut up today and tell people, this is when they were still wearing clothes. <laughs> but I walked over and I picked up the magazine and uh, immediately I was aroused. I almost got an erection right in the store. I said, finally, something's wrong with you. There was a woman at the counter and I finally went up to the counter and I got up the courage to say to her, do you have any books on homosexuality? And she said, yeah, I've got a few. I said, send me a copy of everything you've got. This woman had put two things in this bag that changed my life. One was a little magazine called One, and it was published by the oldest homophile organization in America. They didn't use the word gay. They used the word homophile. 
The next thing was there was a book in there called The Homosexual in America. It was the first gay book ever written that was positive. And when I read this, my God, it told me there were millions of people like me. I had no idea. It was an eye-opener like nothing I'd ever seen. Those books changed my relationship with my wife. All at once, I knew who I was. And I knew that I could no longer be who I wasn't. It was an eye-opener for me. It was as though God had sent me those books. And then something else happened. Here again, a Marine came to our church, and uh, I remember going to bed with him. Okay, then he brings a buddy. Then the buddy stays over one night. The buddy and I have sex. I thought it was incredible sex, but the next morning I'm driving him back out to Camp Bilton, and he says, how could you do that last night? Now I'm ready. I said, how could I do that last night? We both did it and I scared him to death. I just knew he was gonna tell somebody, and he did. The overseer comes down. He said, I've called the clerk of the church. I've asked all the members of the ship of the church to come here tonight. Now, I don't want you to use the word homosexual. You just tell them you feel like you fell the Lord, and that'll be the end of it. They don't have to know why I'm having to remove you here. Well, he talks to me, he says, do you want me to tell your wife? And I said, absolutely not, I'm an adult, I'll tell my wife myself. And he said, well, can you move out of the parsonage tonight? I said, absolutely not, I'm not going anywhere. I said, until my wife and I talk and we decide what we wanna do. Well, I, when I left the meeting, I went and picked up my wife and we took the two kids and we went out to a coffee shop. I said, um, I, said I don't even know where to start. And she said, um, does it have anything to do with those books I found between the mattresses? And I said, yes. And uh, she said, well, I read them. And she said, so you really do believe you're a homosexual? And I said, um, yes. I said, I'm a homosexual. And it was ripping me to pieces. And I said, um, it was ripping me because <clears throat> I loved her. I loved my kids. But I couldn't be dishonest with myself anymore. I told Troy, my oldest little boy, exactly what my mother told me. You gotta, you gotta help your mother. Of course, he was only three years old, but I said, you gotta help your mother. Last time I saw them for 17 years, my baby boy um, was at the airport, LAX. And uh, I put my wife on the plane and uh, she left. He was going through a, his own living hell put it plain uh, at that time because he had lost his two sons and his wife and I wish I'd have been able to wrap my arms around him and tell him it's going to be all right. I had a real argument with God and I said, um, okay, God, I've lost my family. I've lost the church. I'm tired of this. I'm not even going to try again with that. Even though I, you know, I know you call me, I'm just not going to try that anymore. And God, um, they say you hate me. Uh, all I ask is don't bother me, and I promise I won't bother you. Now, I've got to tell you something. God calls each of us in life, every one of you sitting here. God has a divine plan for you. Amen. And I want to tell you, when God has that divine plan, God expects you to go first class. But in that scripture that I read to you about Jonah, Jonah was the original person who decided, you know, God said to him one day, I want you to go. I want you to preach. There's a city that needs to hear what I have to say to them. And Jonah immediately said, not me, Lord. The civil rights movement was still going on. There was the war in Vietnam going on. But it was that kind of a time of everything was in uproar. Life was bigger than life. And there was a lot of optimism and hope. There was fun. It was 1965, 
and the Vietnam War was going on. I received a letter from my draft board in Mobile, Alabama, saying, is it true that you and your wife are no longer together and that uh, you're no longer pastoring a church? And so I wrote them back and said, well, it's true, I'm no longer pastoring a church. And I ended up in Germany. When I got out of the army, my best friend, Willie Smith, was waiting on me, and we moved into our home on Miles Avenue in Huntington Park. And all at once, Willie Smith, um, a friend of his, is visiting, and my God, when he walked in, I took one look at the person with Willie's friend and thought, oh, my Lord. I fall deeply madly in love for the first time in my life. He was the cowboy from Montana, so I took one look and I thought, oh my God, well, he took one look too. It's just one of those kind of things where you know, you know that something's different here. And immediately we started dating. I wanted somebody that I could be proud of and could be proud of me. And uh, so he and I, uh, we, we just were fine for about three months. Um, I'm treating him like the little wife. Well, he doesn't like that at all. Only I don't realize I'm doing it. Finally, after six months, he said, I can't live like this anymore. Then he told me he'd gone to bed with somebody. Uh, well, he worked. It was like, I just died. I think it was devastating. I think he thought that probably God had turned his back on him, that he couldn't believe that this was happening. I kept thinking God doesn't love me. My parents don't understand. He, he now is walking out of my life, the only thing that I've ever loved like this in my life. I love my wife, but my intensity for this man was way beyond that. I said, I have nothing to live for, nothing. And I walked over and um, turned the water on in the tub, took a razor blade, cut both of my, my wrists, and just laid back in the tub and waited. I just didn't want to live anymore. I'm laying in that tub and I'm thinking nobody cares about me. I'm just, in, you know, why, why live? Nobody cares. And um, so when I cut them and laid back and I'm just laying there and I'm starting to get a little drowsy and all at once, I think I remember a voice, uh, Troy, Troy. And then Willie Smith and the young man who'd been my partner broke the door down. Willie loads me up in the car and rushes me to County General Hospital. I'm waiting in this room, and all at once, uh, I'm there by myself. I would prayed, first time in a long time. And I said, I'm a homosexual, so I know you're not going to hear an answer to this prayer. But I said, Lord, I said, uh, I just want to you know, you to help me somehow. God spoke to me in that still small voice in the mind's ear and said to me, Troy, I love you. And you're my son. I don't have stepsons and daughters. It was when that happened that God talked to me. And I didn't believe God would ever talk to me again. It so amazed me. All at once I thought, God spoke to me and said this. I can be gay and Christian. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt, I was a Christian and I was an openly gay male. And it was gonna be okay. For 4,000 years, gay men and women anciently called homosexuals, have been the subject of massive repression, oppression, and exploitation. There was constant police harassment, and that would be outside the bars as well as inside. If they felt like doing whatever they were going to do, arrest you or put you up against the wall, they just did it for absolutely no reason at all that you existed and you were at the wrong place at the wrong time. So you took chances going to a gay bar, and uh, you took chances in people knowing who and what you were. Sure, I've uh, suffered because I was gay. I, when I was a uh, lieutenant in the Air Force, I was blackmailed for $500.
I was dating a young man, and um, we ended up going to the Patch, a dance bar here. Um, it was very, very interesting. The LAPD was there in plain clothes. Uh, we didn't know they were policemen. And um, my date went over to the bar, caught up with a friend of mine, uh, slapped him on the rump. The police arrested them both for lewd and lascivious conduct. It took six hours to get him out, but once we got him out, I took him back to my house, my date, and he was very upset. And um, he said, if I've learned anything from this experience, he said that nobody likes a queer. I said, oh, come on, get off that self-pity trip. And I said, people do care. He said, no, Troy, nobody cares about me. And um, immediately, I'd had my conversion experience again, knew that God loved me. Here I'm trying to witness to people. And he said, um, I said, well, even if people didn't care, and I don't believe that, God cares. And he laughed in my face and said, Troy, God doesn't care about me. He said, would you just take me home? And I took him home. And when I got back to my house, um, I went to God in prayer, as I always do. And I said, God, I said, this is just not right. I said, um, you know, you call me to preach. And God, maybe you're calling me again to do what I've done all my life, almost, and that's to preach. And if you are, you just let me know when, if I'm to start a church, uh, a church with a special outreach into the gay and lesbian community, but with its doors open to everybody. And uh, that still small voice in the mind's ear, let me know now. And with that, I knew I had to start this church. Well, I thought, how wonderful. This is correct. This is true. I mean, uh, uh, this is godlike. <laughs> what I mean, uh, religion isn't supposed to be some fenced off thing and, and, uh, and exclusive rather than inclusive. It was amazing as I started looking, OK, God, you've called me. You said it's okay to start a church. Uh, where do I start it at? And I started looking around and I said, well, you know, you've, you've preached in houses before, so you can start in your living room. That'll save money. You don't have any money, nothing to rent anything. So why don't you just do that? So here's a scrappy, you know, fighter saying, I'm going to make a gay church and he's an ordained minister. You know, that's great. I mean, it had enormous political consequences. But I'm sure there were a lot, even a lot of gay people who have maybe had been leading a life of quiet Episcopalians or something, thought, hmm, no, this isn't, you know, why do we need a gay church? Many gay people really did believe, both men and women, that um, there was just no way God could love you. And when they, many of those heard when I first started Metropolitan Community Church, they laughed. And they said, oh, this is a queen playing church. You know what I mean? This can't really be church. I said, I want to take out an ad in the Advocate. And they laughed at me. And they said, there's, oh, no, no. They said, there's a lot of charlatans in the gay and lesbian community. Why should we sell you an ad? And immediately, I said, well, I'll tell you why. And I testified. So they sold me the ad. So uh, here it was three weeks before I started. The ad appeared in the Advocate. Here, Reverend Troy Perry gave my Huntington Park address. October the 6th, 1968. The first service of Metropolitan Community Church was held in the house behind me. Saturday night, before that, uh, I was walking the floors upstairs, making sure that my sermon was ready. I had prepared it, really prayed over it, and I was going to preach on Be True to You, my first sermon to members of the gay and lesbian community. And uh, my scripture was from the book of Job, Though God slay me, yet I'll trust God. And I wanted to make sure that people understood that I knew God loved me and God loved them too. Personally, myself, I thought, well, he's not going to have a, too many people showing up for services, to be honest with you. People who were gay, they didn't go to church. I got up that morning, had to do everything. I did all the prayers, the announcements, preaching, the communion service, and uh, Willie did the music for me. We had tape recorded the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And so we sounded like there were just a thousand people in church that morning. I was nervous. I've never been more nervous in my life. All at once here I was nervous, something I'd never ever been. I didn't know if anybody would come. I kept browbeating friends, trying to get people to come, but I really didn't know if anybody would show up. There were nine friends and three strangers that first service. There was a woman, a person of color, a Jew, I looked at it as just 
the view of things to come from Metropolitan Community Church. And then Troy came out with his trademark, if you love the Lord this morning, say amen. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning and to feel his power and his spirit. He's a good preacher. He knows how to preach. He knows how to talk. And he knows how to, you know, get people's attention. And when I preached that morning, they were so receptive of my sermon. But it was what happened next when the Holy Spirit moved. And what happened next was I dedicated communion, asked people to come forward. Only three people did, but we all were in tears. We were all crying. There was a move of the Holy Spirit so strong you could have cut it with a knife. We knew something incredible had happened that day. I knew that I had to do things in gay civil rights from the day I started my church. I received a telephone call and someone said, there's a young gay brother who's been murdered by the Los Angeles Police Department. And they told me that um, he had gone to the old Dover Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. It predated bathhouses in America. I went to the inquest. They had testimony from uh, gay men but these people, every time they were brought onto the stand, they were asked by the city, are you a homosexual? And the minute they would say yes, uh, it was like the jury's eyes, it was like um, uh, doors closing, I could see it. And I just couldn't believe what I heard. I guess it sort of pushed Troy over the edge. People were just tired of it. They're tired of the raids and the false entrapments, like enough already. The march is to demonstrate our support for legislation in the field of sex between consenting adults in the state of California. We want to see the laws pertaining to homosexuality dropped so individuals can do anything they want to invent. Set up hope! Set up hope! That was not necessarily something everybody in his community wanted. They were first drawn to him as their religious pastor, not primarily a leader a protest. But he, of course, knowing, uh, having a lot of experience and being something of tremendous courage, knew that we're not going to take, we're not going to take insults. We're not going to take discrimination. We're not going to take having people losing their jobs, losing their lives on account of their sexuality. No. I don't see Tory as political. I see, I see Tory as um, upholding justice issues, which I find essential. Uh, to an understanding of Jesus and indeed of Christianity. This is our first mass demonstration. It certainly won't be the last of the gay community, I'm sure. There were some conservative uh, members in the church that didn't like the idea, but uh, Troy said, enough's enough. We're not going to take this anymore. Everybody kept telling me over and over again, oh my God, no, we're going to get hurt. If we're not careful, we could get hurt. There were an awful lot of gays everywhere saying, well, we, why are you acting up? You know, you're, you're making it bad for the rest of us. Can't you just tone it down? Even his own church, the Los Angeles church, at one point uh, tried to fire him because he was being too activist. They called a congregational meeting. The congregation then fired the board, you know, because they, they were very supportive of Troy's activism. I wanted to make sure that people knew that Jesus said that uh, where I find oppression, I'm going to bring deliverance in Luke 4. And I use that as a jump off point to say, we cannot just sit around and hope somebody else will do our work. We have to do it. God bless you this morning. New York City Church, here you are again. Here we are on this wonderful Easter, and I thank God for you. Amen. <laughs> This last month, I heard a woman who said something that so upset me, I didn't know what to do. She was describing Senator John Edwards, and she called him a faggot on national television. And you know something? We're the last minority left in America. You can hate public, and nobody comes to our defense. Barney's Beanery had a sign that said, faggots stay out. And they spelled faggots wrong, but that didn't get They had it for years. And what was the purpose of putting the sign up? To discourage the faggots from coming in. Clifford Letary, uh, one of those early gay young activists who later died of AIDS, um, he went to Barney's Beanery and decided to go in, and they threw him out of the restaurant. Two, four, six, eight, gay is good and gay is great. June the 26th, 1964. It's an article about a restaurant in Los Angeles with a sign that says, Faggots, keep out. 
the gentleman who put this sign up in this restaurant said he thinks homosexuals should be shot. These are his own words in Life magazine. We're told, of course, the sign today is a joke. We don't consider it a joke. People who had never demonstrated before who showed up were frightened, as usual. The police show up. Uh, some of the folks would automatically start easing away from us, even though they were there with us. Uh, but we were not going to let anybody physically start throwing people out of restaurants, and especially in West Hollywood, because we all lived over here, and it wasn't going to be that way. I really felt the church, I, know, I, I guess you could say, lent the legitimacy to the, uh, to the demonstrations, because Troy would come down in his robes, which was great. He wanted to communicate to other people who have different understandings of religion. I'm religious, and I'm a religious leader, and I deserve your respect as a religious leader. But you don't say that. You have to do it, and he did it. Hey, 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 up, up, At the end of that night, of course, the sign was still there. In 2006, I received a, fellow, a telephone call, and it was very, very interesting in that it was one of our local reporters. And the local reporter says, the new owners, they want to tell you how sorry they are that that ever transpired, and they want you to know that bar is open to everybody, and uh, that sign's gone. I was thankful because it proved to me again, if you live long enough, you see so many incredible things. For him to be out and organizing in such a hostile environment, nationally and really internationally, gave people a lot of courage to come out themselves. I really don't have to take this anymore from anybody. And when you get that going, you have a revolution. We ran into a year of real uh, problems. Um, we met in my home for six weeks, and then we moved to the women's club in Huntington Park. And uh, we got to stay there six months before somebody uh, called the women and said, you got to move. We then moved from there to uh, from the Huntington Park. We started looking for a place to meet. And we said, what are we going to do? And um, we found Embassy Auditorium in downtown Los Angeles. We got to stay there one month. I kept preaching, telling people, whatever you do, don't you miss church. If you do, we're going to move off, and you won't know where we're at. So the crowds just got bigger. It was growing really fast, really fast. Well, at that time you went, there was probably around 100 people. I said, wow, this is the largest congregation he's ever preached to. <laughs> because anything else he had, it was like maybe 30, 40 people. Then we found the Encore Theater and a wonderful man uh, who was Catholic, but said we could use it. And uh, he um, said, I'm not going to take any rent from you. But he said, I want you to put it in the bank so you have money when you get ready to um, to uh, buy your own building. And we were in the Encore Theater, thank God, for a year and three months. Sunday mornings, the Encore Theater was the place to be. You could just feel a loving atmosphere was in the church. When you went in, I mean, it was nothing like anything he had had before. And listening to him, I realized, you know what? His calling has finally came, his true calling he's doing what he was born to do. When he started MCC, I was proud of it because I felt like that he had really found what he was supposed to be doing. My mother, um, God bless her heart, when she got into MCC, everybody loved my mother. If there's a saint um, in my life, it was my mother. Well, it wasn't just us five boys. There was thousands of girls and boys in the church where parents had took and threw these kids out on the street and stuff. My mother would say, these parents, these kids that are thrown out by their parents, I want to take those parents and just shake them. Of course, she became their mom. And we sometimes maybe I uh, felt like they were taking a piece of my mom away from me that was mine, but she gave it willingly and gladly. My mother was not only my mother, uh, but she was my best friend. I say to you, whatever you do, you know, know this. God wants you to go first class. 
I ended up going to one of our churches in North Carolina, and it was just amazing to me. The church secretary said, oh, by the way, the board of directors has asked me to say, don't tell them where you're preaching at this weekend. Now, I have been out of the closet so long, saints, good Lord. I have been out of the closet so long, nobody can tell me to stay in the closet anymore. That don't work for Troy Perry. What closet? My closet burned down a long time ago. I set it on fire. Amen. Yes, the homophile community of Los Angeles is having a rally in downtown Los Angeles today to protest the laws that discriminate against homosexuals. We're trying to change the law that tells two consenting adults that uh, they can't go to bed with each other. Basically, that's what it is in just everyday language. Troy Perry was news because of what he was doing something that no one else had done. He was making church services and prayer available to gay men and lesbians who were being ostracized from their own churches for being gay or lesbian. And I want to tell you we're not afraid anymore. I'm not. I'm going to see some laws passed in this state. I have prayed to my God, asked my God, and I have the assurance some things are going to happen. I'm afraid my private parts are my own and what I want to do with them is my business and not the law. The religion editor of the LA Times, John Dart, uh, called my office and he said, yes. He said, I'm the religion editor and I've been hearing what's been happening with your church. And he said, I'd like to come down and I'd like to interview you. And I said, certainly. And so uh, John Dart came down and interviewed me. And I was really worried. I have to be very honest. We were still treated so badly in the press at that point that I had no idea what the article would be like. Well, the service, it started. Here's the LA Times, and uh, he was writing everything down, everything about the service. I could see him over on the side. And we started, and we were fine as we started the service and uh, till we got to where the choir was going to sing. And I remember I jumped up and said, thank God for the Metropolitan Community Church Choir this morning, our chancel choir. They're going to sing for you. Don't we all love our choir? And everybody applauded like mad. The choir got up. The organ took off, the piano took off, the choir took off, and never did the three ever meet. It was the most god-awful mess I'd ever heard in my life. And on Tuesday, the article started on the front page of the LA Times and went into two pages inside. Will you welcome Reverend Troy Perry? Early on in our movement, um, mine was to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody who got started to be able to intelligently talk about scripture and homosexuality. Um, it's very hard to talk intelligently about it sometimes when people want to scream at you and they believe that's a debate. Well, that's not a debate. If people really want to talk about Scripture, what I believe about God, uh, what I believe as a Christian, I can articulate that and I can talk all day long about that. We don't like to tell people we're a homosexual. There's only one reason we do it and the reason we have gay liberation front groups in the country today is because society has made it its business yeah. to find out who a homosexual is. A homosexual cannot be a policeman, he cannot be a fireman, he cannot be a school teacher. Uh, he can't hold security clearance jobs. Automatically the government comes in and they'll ask you a question, are you a homosexual? And if you check that you are, you'll automatically be turned down and lose your job because they say you can be blackmailed. For me, it was so important that gays and lesbians would start talking about who they were in front of the press. We needed to give role models out there. Troy was just a champion of saying, it's great to come out of the closet. It feels great. You will feel better. Whatever price you pay for coming out of the closet will be worth it. I should never have to explain to anybody what I do. Neither should you. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope the day will come when a person like me won't have to appear on a television program and discuss homosexuality. But that we'll come to the age where people will say, well, yes, those two guys live together, but so what? For me, it was to do that, and for others to do that. It made a difference in this country, and I think around the world, that people were willing to talk about who they were. See, I always love it. When you go first class, God does good things for you. Now, I don't mean first class like I've got to have that new Cadillac. Well, maybe you do. Amen. That's fine. Amen. You want that new Mercedes? Fine. Praise the Lord. Amen. You want the Jag or the Rose Royce? God bless your heart. But you can't forget God. Amen. That's what this is about. Going first class. 
knowing that God requires us to go first class. We started looking around for property and we found a church at 22nd in Union here in Los Angeles, California in a wonderful Hispanic community. And immediately I had to raise money for it. We had to have $10,000 in one week. So I got up in church uh, the next Sunday and I told everybody, I said, uh, um, next week, I said, we're gonna take up an offering. We need $10,000 if we're gonna buy this piece of property. Next Sunday rolled around and I said, I'm gonna take up the offering a little differently. I bought a 30 gallon trash can in and I said, uh, uh, I'm gonna be on one side and our associate pastor, we're gonna hold the can. We want you to come by and just give your offering. I'm not trying to see what you're giving, but we want the offerings here in this can. People threw their, their rings and their, their diamonds and their, you know, everything they had and put it and they raised $10,000. And then they bought this church that was full of trash and they had to spend months you know cleaning it because it was you know but this was the first piece of property that any group associated with the gay community had ever bought i wanted it to be something gorgeous and beautiful uh, because we deserved it i told people over and over again part of my thing around gay liberation was uh you know this this mentality about we don't deserve things has got to stop and i said we deserve just like we want changes in the law we deserve a beautiful building and a church and uh, we're going to do that. And that's exactly what we did. It was mind boggling. I was just amazed at how many wonderful people volunteered. Everybody did for something. We were all there. I mean, uh, I was there painting and hammering nails and doing this stuff just like everybody else. Everybody wanted to, uh, our own beautiful church. The sisters, a lot of them, um, they became painters because the brothers wouldn't, they were afraid of heights. <laughs> the women ended up by default, some of them. But there were women who owned painting companies. It was amazing to me. Everything we needed, including uh, gay plumbers. It was a feeling of it was theirs. I mean, we owned this together. And it was not Troy Perry's. It was all of ours. And our people just worked to, to death. And it was thrilling. It was thrilling to have something to be committed to that way. It was our house. He lives! He lives! Christ Jesus lives today. The day of the dedication, um, over a thousand people showed up. Um, people were around the walls of the church. We ended up with city council members. We ended up uh, with all, I mean, people that, that I didn't expect to see always there, uh, but they came. When I went up the banner and I turned around and looked at the crowd and I had the banner holding it up and, and my eyes got watery. And, uh, <clears throat> and I remember looking at the crowd and I saw all their, their, their happy faces, I mean, uh, their excitement, their, their, and then I would look over to, to the ministers and Troy was ready to burst and I had to turn around real quick and, um, and the, I mean, it was just a great experience. I was as proud as a daddy, standing there staring out at the crowd, you don't know. It, you, you talk about the buttons bursting on the shirt. I mean, I was never so proud in my life and I knew we were home. Right after the Stonewall riots of 1969, a call came from New York to Morris Kite and said, we're gonna do a parade to celebrate the anniversary of Stonewall because all of all it did for our community. We started talking about, you know, that thing in New York City, that really, that's exciting even to us. And I said, why don't we celebrate that? What do we have to do to have a parade in Hollywood? So the big thing was we had to go before the police commission of Los Angeles and get their permission to hold a parade. Saying it and doing it were two different things. You had to apply for a permit, and um, when the word got out that we even applied for a permit to use Hollywood Boulevard, it was a fight, and it was a fight to the last minute. 
chief of police sitting there, Edward M. Davis, who at that time was the most homophobic chief of police in America, I always felt like. I said, if you give these people a parade permit, then you should give it to thieves and burglars. When the permit was finally granted, and believe me, it was reluctantly granted, they had asked us to take out $10 million worth of uh, insurance because they thought all the windows of all the stores on Hollywood Boulevard were gonna be broken by protesters. They said, and we told them, well, have you asked that of anybody else who does a parade? And they said, no, and they said, well, don't ask it of us because you can't, it's unconstitutional. We used the Constitution a lot then. <laughs> June 28th, uh, here again, everybody nervous, getting up early. We came down, we were determined, you know, whatever happened, we we're gonna hold a parade. And really what transpired and happened, this was the birthplace of the modern gay rights movement in Los Angeles, in some ways right here, this parade, uh, because what transpired and happened here was incredible. Uh, people started showing up. Uh, we had floats. We called everybody and we said, whatever you do, bill floats. We don't care. Come, be in the parade, pet section. Well, everybody did exactly that. There we were on McCadden Place, not knowing what we were going to see when we walked out there. Um, and we couldn't see it because we were all back and we were all hidden between buildings and behind the things. When we pulled out and I saw the crowds on the side of the streets here, uh, almost at first it started to cry, but it didn't. I immediately felt so proud that people had gotten the vision and it showed up and that we were saying once and for all to this city, we're not going away, we're here to stay. We were blindsided. We never expected that kind of a reaction. And there was nothing negative. No, no Bible thumpers telling us, you were going to hell, or any of that stuff then. 50,000 people showed up for our parade. And it was just the most incredible thing that I've ever seen. It was amazing that morning. We all felt so incredible and so good. We had everything in that parade. Uh, we had MCC, our group with uh, singing Onward Christian Soldiers marching down the boulevard. My mother and I and my partner in our car behind it. Of course, people started screaming, Troy, 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 like they do. And uh, I waved at the crowds, my mother, my partner, everybody. And uh, we just, to the end of the parade, we never felt so good. You know what's amazing as I look down this street, there are a lot of ghosts here today, a lot of friends here today, uh, people that are no longer here, who really gave a lot to the GLBT community in those early days, uh, but who did stand up and who weren't frightened. And it's just made all the difference in the world, I think, to our movement. So when I stand here on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and McCadden Place, um, I think of all those wonderful people men and women who are not here anymore. And um, uh, I just look and think how far we've come and how thankful I am as we continue to make a difference in this world. I remember preaching at our church in Atlanta, Georgia, years and years ago. Somebody tried to set our church on fire three times Easter week. And I prayed and I said, oh God, I want you to send angels this morning. I want angels around this church to protect us. We need angels here, oh God, to make sure nothing bad happens to people. Well, we started on with the worship service and uh, uh, into our first hymn, the usher at the back door started waving for the pastor Jimmy and Brock and I to come to the back door of the church. We went back and God, there was a young woman standing there, close cropped hair, combat boots, uh, infantry pants, on, you know, a uh, uh, camouflage t-shirt, no bra, I could tell, I mean, you know. <laughs> immediately she stuck out her hand and uh, she said, Reverend Perry, she said, I'm so-and-so, I'm the president of Alpha, and I want to let you know this morning I brought 40 dykes who have surrounded this building, ain't nobody going to bother you today while you worship God, nobody. I was sitting home one night here in Eagle Rock. I remember I got a call from a, a guy, I think his name was Jim Martin, from the LA church called me and said, Frank, the church is burning. Phone rang. It was late, 11, 12 o'clock. I picked up the phone and it was Frank Zarelli. I'm telling her, Lucia, I'm standing here on the 22nd in Union, the church is burned down. So what are you talking about? This is the church. 
There's nothing, there's just the tower. There's nothing left. What do you mean? The church burned down. We were crying on the phone together. How could somebody do that? Why would somebody do that? How could that be? I had flown to Denver, Colorado on business with one of our churches. And the pastor said, um, somebody's called here and said the church has burned down in Los Angeles. I said, what? And I got on the phone, immediately called the assistant pastor of the church. And he said, Troy, he said, the fire department's all around it. He said, um, it looks like it's a total loss. And we pulled up in front, and I think I screamed when I saw it. And I got out of the car, and I just, I just stood there for so long. And finally, the tears started to fall. It was just, it was so awful. Then we got there. Here's the church that we had poured so much into. And here it is in total loss. I mean, we had just, we had worked so hard and done so much and had this place. And somebody had like just taken it away from us. And when I drove up, it was like parting of the sea. Uh, people just moved aside as I walked in. I got under the fire banners and walked up and looked into the church. And um, it was amazing to me, the fire burned right up to the altar, but didn't destroy the altar. And there was our Bible laying open on it. Willie Smith walked up by me and put his arms over my shoulder, and he said, um, um, Troy, he said, everybody's watching you. They need you now more than ever. You've got to really, really um, be a pastor now with these folks. He was trying to be real brave about it, and I could see he was ready to burst, and we went around the building, and I just said, it's okay, and, uh, and just stood firm, no, I'm not going to lose it here. And I went from being sad to absolutely mad, uh, very upset, because the fire department said a suspicious origin. Somebody set that church on fire. Now, once I'm worried where I'm going to hold service, it don't owe me my God out here in the streets, of course. And the city can block it off. When we held that worship service out on the street in front of the burned out church, and the place was packed. I mean, people who normally didn't come to church from the community came down to support us and packed out that street. We gathered out on the street. I think it was a part of the choir. And some other folks have wanted to sit behind a screen so they wouldn't be on camera. Now our church is, we're sitting there outside of our church, which is like ashes. You know, this church the people had built <laughs> out of nothing was, at, and you got some fool standing around saying, well, I don't want to be on camera. Can you put up a screen? You know what Willie Smith told him? Willie said, queen, the closet burned down. It was an honor to be there. It was an honor to be there on the street in front of that burnt out building. I read about this fire, I saw it in the paper, and I had never been to church. So I went down, it, there was this big service in the street, and I, I was looking at him and I was looking at this congregation in the streets crying. He had tears in his eyes when he was talking about it, that they weren't gonna stop it, MCC, from happening. And I looked and I, I, I got immediately how valuable he was. The spirit was there and everybody was, you know, felt that this was not the end. They were not going to burn us out. Matter of fact, the congregation got stronger. We'll just show them that they can't chase us away. We'll just show them how strong we really are. And I walked over and I said, Reverend Troy Perry, and he said, call me Troy. And I said, OK, Troy, you can call me Robin Tyler. My name's Robin, and I'm Jewish. I said, I only came here to support you. I said, but I know something. I know that we are going to do things together. No more will we sit around with fear in our hearts. No more will we sit around and ask them permission to pray or to preach or to sing. We will pray, we will preach, and we will sing, and we will lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our church burning in Los Angeles was the start of some persecution for our denomination. Um, I had no idea that there could be anything worse than losing that building, but I found out there could be. I received a telephone call that a bad fire had taken place at a gay bar in New Orleans, and that 32 people were dead. 12 of those were church members of my church, including the pastor, assistant pastor, and his partner. Bodies burned so bad that there was nothing left but the bones, and they were seared to the floor. What little flesh there was left on some of the bodies, the FBI come in, and so bad, they had to take the fingertips off the bodies. Nobody gives a damn. I couldn't get a lot of help from the local community. I just couldn't put my finger on it. And finally, um, it was almost all business owners wanted to have a meeting with us. And we went to this meeting and immediately the business owners let me know they were not happy. But I heard the comments that were made, faggot, queer, oh, pervert, child molesters. You're embarrassing us, they said. You're making this big deal. I said, it is a big deal. 32 people are dead. Do you understand that in this room? 32 people are dead. And I'm not running away. I'm gonna stay here until I have a service for these people. We went ahead and we did what we said we were gonna do. And we held that memorial service at St. Mark's Methodist Church, Final Little Methodist Church. Let us use the building. But you know something? I've learned that people do care. In our community, we reach out and we touch each other. And we love each other. And we know that God cares. The last Sunday night, the last song, ironically, that was sung in that bar was something they did every week. And it went something like this. United we stand, divided we fall. And if our backs should ever be against the wall, we'll be together. Together, you and I. remember in uh, 1977 during the Anita Bryant fight, I was traveling back to New York City. Well, I'd left here at midnight, flying into New York City, red eye special, and all at once they put the breakfast in front of me and there's the orange juice. And immediately I stopped and I said, whoa, wait a minute, what kind of orange juice is this? I asked the cabin attendant. And she said, what do you mean what kind of orange juice is it? I said, is it California? Is it Texas? Is it Arizona? Is it Florida orange juice? She said, well, it's Minute Maid. I said, then I can't drink it. She said, why? I said, but that's what, that was the question I wanted right there. Yeah. Why? And everybody around me is listening. And I said, because. I said, uh, that is a blend. It contains Florida orange juice. I'm a homosexual. And I said, we're boycotting Florida orange juice because of what Anita Bryan is doing to us. And those other folks from the right wing, people around me started eating 90 miles an hour. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> trying to hold their head down. And finally, I said, take it away. I said, I can't drink that orange juice. Within 10 minutes she was back in the back of the plane again with a young steward, a young male steward who walked back, took one look at me smiled real big and said, Reverend Perry would you come with us? We're going to move you up to first class for the rest of this trip. As you know, I'm John Briggs chairman of the uh, Proposition 6 committee. In 1978 uh, there was a, an initiative on the ballot here in California called Proposition 6. It was the so-called Briggs Initiative. Uh, state senator had uh, qualified an initiative that uh, would have prevented uh, gays and lesbians from teaching in the public school system. It was an outrageous assault on civil liberties and civil rights. I remember getting the first reports and starting to write about it and thinking, this is really bad. This is really, really bad. And coming right on the heels of the Anita Bryant thing, it just felt like something that was gonna sweep the country so it had to be stopped I thought oh my god I don't believe this here we go here again we started saying what are we gonna do about this we've got to do something that was the one of the very first times that the community rallied together and we raised an enormous amount of money for this war campaign and I said, God, this is not right. Uh, you've told me I'm to stand up for myself and for others, and I want to know what I should do. And immediately, God let me know that I was to fast and uh, to pray, ask people for money. 
and we needed, I wanted $100,000, so I announced the gay community. I would fast and pray here at the federal building until we raised that amount of money. A lot of people said, this isn't a good idea. We're never going to get the money. Uh, you've got to find some other way to get the money. But Troy was determined. He said he prayed about it. God told him this is what he should do. And I remember Troy leaving the office that morning. You know, we were packing up all the stuff and getting the sleeping bag together and heading down for the, the federal building downtown. And he was just... It was just calm as could be, just, you know, do we have all our stuff together? Just like we were going on a picnic. People could get very brave sometimes. I had one person, a street preacher, who came down, as it turned out later, I, I found out what they were, uh, but came up and immediately started preaching at me. And I finally said, uh, look, do you have any children? Yes, I have a son. I said, have you ever thought that one of them might be a homosexual? And she slapped me a square in the face. I was so shocked, I didn't know what to do. Lots of people would come down and support him and just sit with him, sit around. We had signs, and people would stop and read the signs going in. Uh, we'd get some disparaging remarks. And there were times at night, police cars would pass the front of the federal building and sound their sirens just to wake him up and annoy him. I remember one person who came up, a man, told me, oh, after the third day, your stomach won't hurt. That is a lie of the devil. It is a painful way uh, to get attention. I slept there, only drank water for 16 days, no food or anything like that. And uh, thank God, I mean, it was an amazing thing to me. The lesbian made a phone call and said, uh, what is it going to take to get Troy Perry off of uh, the, the steps of the federal building? And she immediately gave the money, and we went over with $105,000. And I used that money from fasting here to do the first poll ever in American history on what people thought about gays and lesbians and about the Briggs Initiative. Checkbook activism is fine, but Going on a hunger fast is a whole other level. It was a profound act of civil disobedience and protest against a sheer madness. And when election day came, we won. Even though the polls had shown uh, when we first started, we couldn't win. We ended up with 56.8% of the votes. Uh, on our side, on the day of the election, the citizens of California finally, we had educated them enough that they knew this was purely discrimination, nothing more. Really, he made the difference. Without that initial war chest, that initial money uh, that for that state organization, they could not have won that. They got the governor of California, Ronald Reagan, to come out against the Briggs Initiative, which is really remarkable and it just validated everything that I believed about our freedoms. It's do what's right, don't back away. Uh, we don't want to fight, but when they bring the fight to us, do not back away. Then a friend of mine, Robin Tyler, called me and said, I want to call. It's time for us to have a national march. Don't you think we are, you know, don't you agree with me? And I said, absolutely I do. And so she called for the first March on Washington. And I said, there's a gay train across the country that's going to the March on Washington. And why don't we get on the train together? And every place the train stops, we'll speak. We'll do like the, you know, the, the, the Mr., you know, the President and Mrs. Roosevelt tour. And we can get on the back of the train and we can speak to gay people. The mood was festive aboard the Amtrak Freedom Train as it left the Oakland, California terminal carrying some 75 lesbians and gay men to Sunday's National March on Washington for a lesbian and gay ride. We got on the train and there were like three or 400 gay men and four lesbians that wouldn't talk to them because it was that period of time, right? And we put a piano on the train and we had a bar. We had a, the gay bar on the train. And uh, it was the most incredible trip. Everywhere the train would stop, the press would be out. We had really worked it out. So even in small towns, the press came out to cover us. First, we want to thank everybody from Utah who's come out to welcome us. We know this is a rough state for gay people. Yeah. Which are here, we really appreciate it. A lot of times, people wouldn't come to hear us because they were too scared to come out in the middle of the country to hear Troy Perry out of the closet and Robin Tyler, right? So our guys would get off the train just as it was pulling into a station, 
and they would have, you know, welcome to wherever. <laughs> and they would look, and they, the headlines would read, hundreds of homosexuals greet Reverend. There's always a few MCCers, because MCCers get up at any time. It's important that all over the country this weekend, the gay men and women stand up. And we let our society, wherever we're at, realize and know that we're not taking the back seat of the bus or the train anymore. We're here to get our rights, and that's that. And then in Ogden, Utah, when the train stopped, uh, again, I think at four in the morning or something, with a little gaggle of MCC people, um, the train didn't take off again, and there was a kind of a flurry of upsetness, and someone said that there was a preacher standing in front of the train with a sign, uh, a homophobic sign. And of course, Trey said, no, don't start the train. And I'm saying, start the train, you know, to heck with it. He'll jump off and no, no, Sister Robin, we can't start the train. Now, he was smart. Uh, he knew he was going to get up before the train uh, got there. But he, it was enough to get the press there. Well, I didn't mind that at all. And I walked right up there and talked to him. This is the worst sin in the Bible. Is what is this? Is God's going to have somebody that's going to tell you to deal with the truth. Say that. What is this? Uh, it's it's the worst sin in the Bible. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you Give need the verse in scripture. You read the Bible. I have read the Bible. I've read Romans 1, 26 through 28, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10. Listen, it was destroyed because God couldn't find 10 righteous people in a period. That's what the scriptures say. Nothing to do with homosexuality. Oh, yeah. Homosexuality is the worst, worst sin in the Bible. I think one of the things about Troy that we've come to love the most is he will stride right into the middle of something and face it, and face it graciously, and face it with faith, and with courage, and with eloquence, but with reason. Uh, you don't usually hear reason and religion in the same sentence. We went on into Washington, D.C. Hundreds of people showed up at the train station. Everybody wanted to come down and welcome us, and it was just incredible. We were flying it all by the seat of our pants. Uh, we didn't know what was going to happen. I want those counties and counties out there to turn around and open a one of the largest demonstrations in the history of this country. Look at that crowd. Look at that crowd. I was actually anchoring the live broadcast. Of, so I was like on, in a, at a broadcast table back from the stage. What I can tell you is that we had a list of speakers that Troy was not on. They did not want Troy to speak because he was Christian, and they put him on last. And I knew at this point, years, you know, in that year, in 1979, what an audience he reached of like minds of Christians, and I thought he was a very important leader. And so I went against the March Committee. This is why I'm always in trouble. <laughs> and I went against, and I put him on right up front. When you're invited to be a speaker at a march on Washington, you're humbled, and you're nervous, and you thank God when you look out and see how many people are there. That first time, it was just incredible, and it gave me again such hope for our movement. I couldn't believe that kind of a crowd showed up. And so when I spoke to America, I tried to tell people, and spoke to our community too, that here we are, we deserve everything everybody else does, and we're not gonna rest until we get it. We say to you, we're going to have our rights. We're your children. We're not going away. We're going to keep moving until we're treated like every other citizen in this country. That's where we're at. The rank and file folks in the crowd heard this guy holler and shout about how we're not turning back anymore, we're not afraid anymore, and they did not care if he was wearing a collar turned backwards, let me tell you. They did not care. What they cared was he said good things about our liberation and said God doesn't hate you. 250,000 in the daylight, no famines, no pestilence, no earthquakes, no floods. Oh, eat your heart out, Anita Bryant. My partner, when I met Philip, Philip was a waiter at a Thai restaurant. And I didn't meet him in the restaurant. It was very weird. I won't tell you where I met him. I'll just leave. <laughs> I, actually, I met him in a leather bar. Amen. Let me tell you. Ooh, yes. 
When he said daddy, I, my heart always flutters. Amen. Yeah. And yet your pastor was not talking, but my lover knows just how to get it out of me. Amen. All he's got to do is say, thank you, daddy. Ooh, the heart just speeds up. Amen. A church member I know came up and... Um, uh, C.J. Austin, and he said, Troy, Troy, I want you to meet. This is Philip DeBleek. And uh, I said, oh, as I always do, I'm very friendly. I stopped and I said, um, well, I'm so glad to meet you. You know what I mean? I hope you'll come back to church again. Two years later, walked into the gauntlet, my local gay bar, the leather bar in my neighborhood where I live up in the Hollywood Hills. I, as I'm looking around the room, all at once I looked up and there was a young man down at the end of the bar. He is giving me the once over. There was something about Troy that, that really resonated with me. Um, he has amazing eyes. Um, and I just felt, felt a connection to him. Um, at some point uh, along the course of the evening, I made my way over to um, where he was. He came back by, reached over, tried to give me a note, and I knew it was his uh, phone number, and I said, no, 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 no. I said, uh, I'm gonna tell you my phone number one time. And I said, if you wanna see me, you give me a call in two weeks. And I told him my phone number one time. Okay, walked out of the bar, didn't think any more about it, and yet I did. I mean, he was just so good looking in my head, oh. So that entire evening, that's all I did was keep playing the phone number over in my head and made sure that I did remember it. And uh, I did call him. Uh, two weeks later, my mother, I'd gone out running and I came back in and my mother said, uh, your phone's been ringing. I said, and I knew who it was. I just knew that it was gonna be Philip DeBleek. On our first date, I'm not sure you would actually call it a date. Um, I had decided specifically to go back to the Gauntlet Bar to see if I could run into Troy. Try to make it seem like it was impromptu, but um, I had my own ulterior motives. I said, well, I said, are we gonna start this relationship tonight? And uh, he said, yes. And we sat in the bar for quite a few hours talking and, and getting to know each other. And um, the next morning, I went and told my best buddy that day, oh, I said, I've just met a perfect 10. And after three months of, of being together, um, he said, you know, this is stupid. Why don't you just move in? So, I mean, it was very intense and very quick. But I think we both realized that there was something really special that we felt for each other. And 22 years later, um, we fell in love. We have had the most incredible life. Um, I couldn't have asked for anybody in my life better. He's the most gentle man in the world. And that he was into leather. I live a fully gay lifestyle. I will not back away from who I am. I'll not back away from being a Christian. I won't be a back away from being a gay man. I won't back away from being a leather man. I'm not gonna back away from uh, anything that is in my life. I'm just not gonna do that. I'd been a member of MCC for a number of years before I came out as a leather man. And, um, and I think just knowing that Troy was leather or leather light um, probably influenced that too. It made me feel more comfortable doing that. It, certainly he wasn't the one that uh, pushed me in that direction, but I think it made me comfortable. But I was wearing leather and, and I came back from, I was sitting down after doing my piece, either reading scripture or praying, whatever. And as I sat down, he just leaned over to me like we're old friends and said, I'm just so glad you're wearing leather. And I thought, okay, woof, that's a good thing. I like that. And I felt a strong bond with him at that moment, and it's just grown deeper over the years. I think absolutely Troy's presence in the leather community did have a lot of pe help a lot of people, but much more than that, I think Troy's presence in the greater gay community was something fantastic. Troy came out as a shining light. Here is something where I could believe that God wanted me. I couldn't do something like that. I think the whole message of Metropolitan Community Churches has been the integration of sexuality and spirituality. I mean, they're the, they're the two taboos. I think that we make better choices in our lives um, when that full integration is in place. Healthier choices around sex, healthier choices around relationships, healthier choices about what we will and will not do, um, when we can be totally honest that sex figures in our lives and that it's not bad. You know, it only becomes bad when it's destructive. And we see too much of that in our world today.
in certain kind of under, sexual underground circles, it was being noted that people were, get, were beginning to get sick. All of a sudden in the paper, there's something called the gay disease, the gay plague. All of a sudden, we were dealing with a disease that, that looked like it was going to totally marginalize the gay community. And then once the cat was out of the bag, it began to happen very, very quickly. People would get sick and lose their jobs, be thrown out of their apartments, many times their possessions thrown into dumpsters because their families didn't want to come and help them. It was bad. AIDS affected me just as it did every person, I think, in our community. It certainly affected me in that um, all at once, I'm spending all this time in hospitals, going to people's homes, watching people die, preaching funerals. We were used to ministering to the sick. We were used to, you know, caring for each other, feeding people, you know. But when all of a sudden everybody was just dying. About 5,000 of our members died of AIDS in the 80s. And uh, we're not a gigantic denomination like the Southern Baptists or the United Methodists or the Roman Catholic Church. And in the middle of that, I fell in love with my sisters all over again. If it hadn't been for the women, I don't know what we would have done. Uh, we had pastors who were sick with AIDS, trying to do funerals and all, and thank God the women uh, came to the forefront. And it wasn't easy. Some of them got very tired of it, but they came in and helped us with the death and dying. They held the funerals to the women clergy. Everything that men did, they did too. And I remember Troy just spending a lot of time on the phone with other pastors who were freaking. I remember one, he had done 14 funerals in barely two weeks. And he just, he, lo he just, he lost his grip. Troy had some very bad times during the AIDS crisis. I mean, his best friend, Joseph McDuffie, who was Troy's dearest friend for many years, died of AIDS and that really depressed Troy very badly. I remember I had picked him up at the airport from some trip he was on and we got back to the house and Philip was waiting outside the house to tell him that Joseph had died. And Troy, he just, you know, just kind of sagged and cried. You know, we've cried in each other's arms. I don't know what I would do without Troy um, to help me and, and console me. And I can only hope that I've been able to be there for Troy as well during his times of grief and his suffering. Jesus is still the great healer, amen. Philip, when he was first diagnosed, like every young gay male at that time, he had watched his friends die and he said, I'm just going to commit suicide. And I said, no, you're not. Not in this house, you're not. I said, I'm going to pray for you every day. I'm going to lay hands on you every day. And I said, when we go to bed at night, we're going to pray together. And I said, I promise you I'll do that. We'll walk through this valley together. And during those first few years, it was so cute. God forbid if I came in and laid down, went to sleep, and he came in, he would wake me up and said, aren't you going to lay hands on me and pray tonight? And I would always do that. It was difficult to sit by and watch all my friends die and, and wonder why they needed to go through this pain and suffering, why I had to sit through this pain and suffering and watch them all die. What's the reason behind it? When you look at AIDS, God's judgment because of the homosexual promiscuity in this land, and herpes, God's judgment because of heterosexual promiscuity, one can only use his imagination to determine what is God going to do to judge America because of 13 million little babies we've murdered since 1973. It wasn't just, oh, there's gay people. It was, there's gay people and they're even sicker than you thought they were. You know, they spread disease, some kind of infection that you don't even know what the infection is about and it could creep up and it could get you. Oh boy, that was something they could really hang on to and really twist and squeeze for everything it was worth. 
I preach the same gospel that Jerry Falwell does. Um, I don't believe that any disease, I don't care what it is, is a gift from God to a class of people. When we start using words like uh, that God has given, you know, AIDS to homosexuals because, quote, of the, their, uh, as a result of their lifestyle, we're off the boat somewhere. When the rage started and the act up started where people were saying, damn it, do something. This is not our fault. Something is amiss here and something needs to be done. I think that kind of got people back to, oh, that's right. I'm not, it's not me. I'm not bad. But it took a while for us to remember that it, it wasn't our fault. It wasn't our fault. We didn't do it. Seize control! Seize control! AIDS was the single most important thing that happened to our community. Spiritually, politically, uh, in terms of community, in terms of identity formation. We had to come together like we'd never come together before. We had to come together. And Troy was right out there leading. Troy got up and he says, God is greater than AIDS. If it hadn't been for our community, I don't know what would have happened. The government didn't try to help us. We decided and said we have to do what we have to do around this issue. We would frequently hold demonstrations. It got the press out. And the more press you got out, the more people were educated. When it was just blacks, or it was just Hispanics, or it was just gays, they didn't care. But the minute it started moving, uh, out of those communities and moved into the general community. Then all at once, it was too late. I said, the day will come. We're going to say to them, we want all of our friends back. You have murdered our friends. And today, of course, we're giving millions of dollars um, to people, thank God, all over the world. Our government now is giving money uh, to other cultures and other countries but it doesn't bring anybody back because our government waited too late. Dearly beloved, we're gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this company to join these two persons in holy matrimony, which is an honorable estate instituted of God, signifying unto us the mysterious union that is between Christ and his church. Into this holy estate, these two persons present come now to be joined. When I first founded Metropolitan Community Church, I wanted people to know even in church we were going to do everything every other church group did. She may so live together in this life that in the world to come you may have life everlasting. Amen. I started marrying couples in 1969, January of 1969. And the first time a couple came and said, would you marry us? And I said, yes. And I started my struggle and my fight over marriage. I've always wanted to be married. The marriage issue is kind of um, one of the last big ticket items in this march towards full, complete, equal civil rights under the law, and that's all it is. Two people of the same sex who want to make a lifetime commitment to each other deserve the same rights as two people of opposite sex who have made a lifetime commitment to each other. Amen. At the March on Washington's, um, the last three, uh, I always had the demonstration called the wedding. We held right out in front of the um, uh, uh, Internal Revenue Service uh, because we wanted people to know we pour, paid more taxes than anybody else. Uh, my partner and I, we pay to send everybody else's kids to school, and I don't mind that, but then I'm going to be treated like everybody else. That's always been my stance. It was amazing. Every time I did this, um, the crowds kept getting bigger. And in the year 2000, the largest crowd of all, we ended up with um, 10,000 couples in front of the Lincoln Memorial and um, we ended up with 17,000 of their friends all around them to throw the rice and all. Every time I got up and I led these people through it, Philip and I went through it with everybody else. And we made our vows to each other over and over again. But I said to him, one day we're going to be able to marry. 
What do we want? The right to marry. When do we want it? Now. We're here today to demonstrate for the six year uh, for the right to marry in the state of California. We've done it for six years. We hope this will be our last year. Troy's always been a voice of the people. And he came to me and asked me if I would be willing to dedicate every um, February 14th towards going to the uh, courthouses to try and obtain a marriage license. I think the purpose in in going out and trying to obtain a marriage license was really to show others that we were committed. I think that when people see two individuals who truly and deeply care and love for each other, I think that, that those type of images help to change the mindsets of others. Philip and I, we do this every year on Valentine's. We go to the courthouse to demonstrate. We went there to get married at first, but once Canada said we could marry, and um, I said then, we're gonna go to Canada and we're gonna get married. I'm leading these demonstrations, but I'm not gonna wait. I said, I all my life have wanted to marry my partner. And I said, it's the first time in my life that I can do it and it's legal somewhere. And the funny thing is that a few days later after he told me we were gonna do it, he realized that he hadn't actually asked me for my hand in marriage. So um, he came home and he got down on one knee and he did ask me to marry him, which was, which was very touching. Broke down, crying was the most emotional thing for me and asked him would he marry me, and he was crying too, and he said he would. Help me get up off the floor. And <laughs> immediately we made our plans. It was very quick, and, and I, it wasn't that I was nervous up until about an hour before the ceremony was to start. I didn't really feel the butterflies until that point. I was about to to really marry the man that I loved and how many people before me could say that they've done that. And the actual event is sort of all a blur in my mind now. When Reverend Brent Hawks pronounced us married and I kissed Philip, we both were in tears. I said to him, I love you more than you'll ever know till death do us part. I meant that. And I thought, from the time I did that first wedding, from 1969 to 2003, I could not believe I was standing there and it was legal. Philip and I, in my heart of hearts, um, my partner is so important to me. I'm madly in love with my partner after 22 years. Philip and I flew back to California and I knew I could no longer sit around and let the state of California get away with not marrying me. And so um, we uh, really talked about it. We talked to uh, Robin Tyler and her partner, Diane Olson, and we decided we were gonna sue the state of California. Uh, the two of them, for the right to marry in the state of California, Philip and I, uh, for the US government and the state of California do what they're supposed to do with the Constitution, that's to recognize marriages from other places. We're, we're not talking about sexual orientation, we're talking about the right to love. It's a much stronger premise. Don't let them put us in sexual orientation. And so Troy, again and again and again, has not talked about sex, he's talked about love. And, having to, and we're not a lifestyle, we're, it's our lives. This isn't about our lifestyle. Lifestyle is when you disco dance. Lives are when you want to keep your children and not be killed in Alabama. There is definitely um, a, a certain security that comes with knowing that, that I have benefits that only married couples have. I've spent nearly a quarter of a century with this man. I, I I think I've earned the right to be acknowledged as, as his spouse.
We won in the Superior Court of California. We lost in the Appeals Court two to one. And I thought it would end there that the Supreme Court of the State of California might just say, well, that's that. We'll just accept what the Court of Appeals said. But they didn't. And um, later this year, the Supreme Court of the State of California will be making their decisions on the legitimacy of marriage here in the state of California for same-sex couples. The Honorable Chief Justice and Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of California. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court, sitting in bank, is now in session. They will really look at this issue, but I don't know if they'll have the courage to say this is in the Constitution. This equality actually is mandated by the state constitution. The constitution is clear under the Equal Protection Clause of the state constitution that you can't <laughs> allow one group uh, the rights and privileges of the state and deny another. Here we're saying gays and lesbians are being denied that right which is offered to uh, opposite sex couples. So we should Just, recognize their status as a protected class? Um, I, I think we should. Uh, uh, and recognize. do we need to do that to get to the outcome you urge? No, Your Honor, because I think the fundamental issue is whether there is a fundamental right to marry. All right. Thank you. I do not want to cry. This is too important. <laughs> you know what I mean? That uh, they, they uh, you know, we have just won this historical after 39 years of fighting for this. On March 4th, 2008, we appeared before the California Supreme Court on an historic civil rights case. We argued that our clients, two same gender couples, should enjoy the right to marry in California and that the current ban on such marriages is unconstitutional. Today, we have won our case and new rights for all same gender couples in California who will now enjoy the right to marry the person of their choice, the one that they love. I'm thankful because I'm in love with my partner. We're celebrating in another month, 23 years together, and we thank God for that. I mean, it is just, you don't know what this does for us today. But we're thankful today that at long last, our marriage from Canada is legal in the state of California. It's Troy at his best, uh, taking on the system, forcing the system uh, to look at itself through the mirror he holds up. It is the most incredible feeling to have the state of California recognize our marriage against all odds when people told us we couldn't do it. What a victory this is. When last night, Philip, now I'm the excitable one, as you know. <laughs> last night, Philip said to me, he said, um, you know, uh, Troy, I want to remind you, because he knows me, I get real emotional. And he said, no matter what the Supreme Court says, we are married. Amen. It's going to help couples all across America. They can't discriminate anymore. I don't mean that everybody has to go marry. I've often said I support heterosexuals and gay folks who don't want to marry. But for we who do, you're not going to use the law to tell me I can't. I just love Jesus. I preach a sermon sometimes called the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> and the main thing is Jesus. Amen. Amen. We who are part of the Christian faith, the main thing is Jesus. See, Jesus went first class. I look back and I thank God. People are always asking me, well, are you enjoying retirement? I said, absolutely, I love being retired. And they said, but you haven't quit traveling, have you? I said, no. I said, I'm still doing things. It's hard as a brother to, to talk about him sometimes because as I tell people, I look at him in awe with what he's done. Then I look at him as a brother and say, ah, that's just Troy. His influence will still be strong, I'm sure, but he's smart enough to not be waving it around. Troy is a political activist. He's a public speaker. He's a humanitarian. Um, he wants to change the world 
a little bit for the better each day, and he strives to do that. Politically, uh, I'm still going to meet with people when I go to a different country. I try to meet with the prime minister or the president or um, somebody in government so I can talk to them. I don't want anybody to ever suffer uh, because they don't have rights in the culture they live. It wasn't easy, but when the chips were down, Troy would be there on the side of right and justice. He has the courage to do what other people won't do, and, and he's a visionary also. So I don't call bureaucrats, and bureaucrats are usually executive directors of organizations. I call visionary. And, and, and so Troy, to me, has been consistently the most visionary in the gay movement, and I think singularly one of the most important heroes we've had. When I look at Troy Perry, I don't see gay. I see humanity. I see courage. I see civil libertarian. If you have a strong faith in your belief, you can overcome anything. What does the Bible say? With your faith, you can move mountains. We ain't moving mountains, but I think Troy, anybody closest could do it. Jesus, who was God in the flesh. Amen. Jesus, when he died, they took him off the cross and they put him in a grave. And oh my God, three days later, he went first class. Amen. Amen. They thought they had him, but he got away. Amen. <laughs> On that day of resurrection, amen. Jesus rose from the dead. I preached and I've said to our community for 38 years, whatever we do, we've got to go first class. God calls us to go first class. No other way except first class. The Church of Jesus Christ can never be the same again. Today, the Episcopal Church has an openly gay bishop. I mean, I don't think that ever would have happened without Troy starting MCC in 1968. Just as Martin Luther went to, the, to that, that door and, and put the 95 pieces on the door, you're not going to keep religion away from the people. Troy went to the whole world, and he says, you can't box God up and, and control God, you know. We, we just let him out of the box. I believe we can change the world. And so for me, my legacy, I hope, will be inside and outside of my community, was he was faithful and he was fearless. He's a hero. He's an archetype. He, to me, he's the archetype of a gay hero. He cut the mold. And there are not few people like that. Troy walked the walk and talked the talk and allowed his life to be the, the beacon that has led other people to do the same. We hope the day will come when a person like me won't have to appear on a television program and discuss homosexuality but that will come to the age where people will say, well, yes, those two guys live together, but so what? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Troy Perry has shown the world that we are part of the whosoever. This church has always been here. 38 years later, we're the ones who made the difference in the world. Amen. When people said we were not anything, when people said we were unworthy, this church said, you can go first class. God bless you this morning, saints. Amen. When Troy meets God, you know, the, all I can hear is that there's an old gospel song that said, good and faithful servant, well done. My aunt, when she laid hands on me, said, Troy, she said, God is going to use you mightily in the faith. Not in the church you think it's going to be, but God is going to use you. And of course, my Pentecostal faith, I thought she's nutty as a fruitcake. I'm not about to leave the church that here I am a part of. But they left me one day. And as a result of that, in my struggles and my fights, um, I ended up finally calming down enough to listen for God's still small voice. And once God said, I'm not through with you yet, and after that suicide attempt, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, again, that God loved me, and I was going to love God back for the rest of my life.